Whether you're a skeptic or a believer, join me, Rob McConnell, as together we'll investigate the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology here on the Exxon Radio TV show on XZBN and the Exxon TV channel on Simul TV. Since 1990, the Exxon Radio TV show has been the place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. Together, we'll investigate UFOs, aliens, ghosts, Bigfoot, psychic phenomena, lake monsters, conspiracy theories, government cover-ups, the truth embargo, alien abductions, ESP, haunted locations from around the world, and so much more. With over 28 years of broadcasting and more than 4,500 individual guests, the Exxon is truly a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality, as evidenced by the credibility, integrity, and professionalism of the guests that we bring to our international audience. If you have seen a UFO, had a close encounter, seen a ghost, Bigfoot, lake monster, or a story that you would like to share or have investigated, contact me, Rob McConnell, by sending me your email to xzone at xzoneradiotv.com or you can call toll-free 1-800-610-7035, extension 143, and on Skype, Exxon Radio TV. For more information on the Exxon Radio TV show with yours truly, Rob McConnell, visit www.exxoneradiotv.com or www.exxonetvchannel.com or simultv.com and xzbn.net. Until next we meet here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Always remember X-Zone Nation. Keep your eyes to the sky and your heart in the light. This is A Different Perspective with Kevin Randall. A retired U.S. Lieutenant Colonel, Kevin Randall has been studying UFOs for nearly 50 years. Kevin has investigated some of the most famous UFO cases in the world and has been consulted for dozens of documentaries about UFOs. Considered one of the leading experts into the Roswell UFO crash of 1947, Kevin has written more than 25 books about UFOs, including the recently published Roswell in the 21st century. Now, here is the host of A Different Perspective, Kevin Randall. And welcome to A Different Perspective. I am sitting high atop the International UFO Museum and Research Center in Roswell, New Mexico. Well, actually, I'm on the first floor, and we're in a little tiny room here. I'm joined by Don Schmidt, who is one of the culprits in creating this great massive entity here in Roswell. In other words, Don and I uh, started the investigation more than 30 years ago, looking into the Roswell UFO crash. And from there, we've written books. We've uh, interested other people, and other books have come out, and they've created this massive, uh, entity, and people are sicker than ever. No, that was a line from we the hospital. We created a monster, yes. We created a monster. Anywhere, here is Don Schmidt in Roswell, New Mexico. Welcome to A Different all Perspective. all places to see you again, Kevin. So. <laughs> I know. We live We live like four miles apart, and, and I never see you. And two guys from the Midwest, from Iowa and Wisconsin, that, you know, the, between the movie and the museum and all the books and everything else, and, uh, and for everybody who was telling us we couldn't do it, well, it happened. There you go. Uh, what, uh, what, you were out on the debris field yesterday with the Sci-Fi Channel or something? No, 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 no. It was with a uh, Spanish film crew. They were at one of the television shows. And uh, they had contacted me about just getting out there. And I told them when I was first getting into the town. But uh, I was more surprised that the old Heinz house, the very one-room shack, the building that Mac Brazel, the very ranch foreman, had uh, stayed the night before with uh, intelligence officer Jesse Marcel and counterintelligence officer Sheridan Cabot the night before they investigated the debris field. And after all these years, for 30 years, to just see it as, you know, just a common landmark and a throwback to the very event and to see it gone. 
Well, wasn't the, the Heinz house when we were there the first time, wasn't it being used for like hay storage or it something? It still was. In fact, I think the very last time I was there, it was vacant. It was open. So we, I, and I had been inside a number of times. And you could see where even some of the piping, that where there was at least running water at one time or another. And it was a cistern uh, off to the side. But, um, and then even the original uh, uh, the cattle pen where the livestock shed was located. And even in the very press release where it says that the ranchers stored the disc in a livestock shed. Well, it was actually a big piece that he dragged behind the pickup truck or whatever that first night. And that even was, was taken down maybe a dozen years ago. So it's like slowly, you know. The history is being the erased. The history is being erased. Now, the one thing that's still out there is the very stone cairn that we erected back in September of 89 when we did the first uh, archaeological. Uh -huh. Well, it wasn't really a dig. But, you know, mapping out, you know, the site and laying out a systematic grid having it, and where we mounted a theatolite, the survey meter. And that stone cairn with that steel pipe, now after 30 years, is still there. Well, um, that was a dig done for the Sci-Fi Channel originally. I mean, No, that was with Argonne. What, what, I, what I was getting at, oh. the, well, you, there were, no, there was a... Um, uh, a documentary done out there. I got yes, it. yes, yes. That was for the Sci Fi Channel 2002. And, well, I, I was thinking of uh, Dolman and his dig. Oh, that was in 2000, 2006. Uh, what, there was an archaeological site survey done out there with a, uh, I guess, an archaeologist from the University of New Mexico. Right. And they gathered a whole bunch of bags of, of soil, of soil ground and, for particle analysis. Yeah. Does that, did that ever happen? Well, they stored. Those 50-some bags of ground, they were all in these hermetically sealed you know, plastic line bags in the uh, local Wells Fargo bank in a security box or a security uh, vault area. And we would get after the Sci-Fi Channel month after month. When is the professor going to come down from the university and finally take back you know, those ground samples to do the particle analysis? And for us, it was as simple as just you know, running the, the bags as far as into a tray, and then it's under even just black light that metal particles would would, 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 would expose themselves, would shine would off of the black light, would be, be, be fluorescent, yeah. And he finally, after a year, so he succumbed to all the pressure, and he came down, and I get a phone call from the museum, and they're laughing because... He stops by and he wants to borrow a wet vac. What do you need a wet vac for? Why well, I need to go back to the bank. Well, the bank, don't they have a wet you know, vacuum cleaner? Well, I don't want them to see. Well, in his scientific expertise, what he didn't realize, what happens to sealed ground after a lengthy period of time? Well, it starts to germinate. It's alive. Yes. And as he was picking up the bags and the bank vault, the bottoms were all dropping out. So what you're saying is this great experiment came everything to naught. Was, yeah, everything was contaminated. Everything was for naught, as you said. And it was, once again, my learning the hard way that science is only science in so much as that something is accomplished and there's a breakthrough. Otherwise, it's theory, it's hypothetical, and it's... Well, I know, I know that uh, there's a lot of controversy about the Roswell case now, and I think we've learned some of the witnesses were not as candid as they could be. Of course. We're telling the truth. Right. Where do you stand on the Roswell case today? What do you, what do you think is the best witnesses, the best evidence, that sort of thing? What impressed me more and more in the latter years of the investigation were certainly the deathbed testimonies. When, uh, and you yourself had interviewed Carlene Green, for example, the mm -hmm. last time you were here at the museum. And her, her father, Sergeant Homer Rowlett, and his calling her over to his gurney just before he was to go in for heart surgery and confessing to her his involvement and in being part of the actual recovery team. And as the others, you know, always mentioning the bodies regarding their deathbed testimonies. And then for him to also state that one was alive, which was also consistent with the deathbeds. But but it's secondhand testimony. 
From the family, yes. But, but still second hand. But it also came from her brother, Larry. Larry Rowlett Wall, as well, as in, a, in a separate situation. But what I'm saying is it's still secondhand testimony. It's not the guy who was actually there telling right. you the story. And right. I found that in my investigations of many cases, not just Roswell, that the secondhand testimonies, they, they sometimes are embellished, confabulated. Yes, of course, um, of course. Not, not, not saying that people are doing anything to be deceitful or anything like that, but the, I guess in the course of relating the story from one person to another, they... Uh, get changed slightly or embellished slightly. Of course. And, and doesn't that render the testimony from secondhand sources a little bit? If it's uh, a single secondhand source, but when it's a, uh, a, a, an accumulation of secondhand sources, and in these cases, being the families, being the spouses, when, for example, when I went to interview uh, Lieutenant Colonel Edgar Skelly, who was with the 393rd Bomb Squadron, and he was head of that very... Uh, he would have been the operations officer on the, the uh, Necessary Evil, which was the actual B-29 that the likes of Lloyd Thompson and Felix Bartucci and Robert Slusher and Arthur Ossetrup well, would these, have been on. And these are all people we've talked to for the most part. Right. Felix Martucci, we, we actually we, staked out his apartment in, down in, in San Antonio, San Antonio right. waiting for him to come back, and he right. never and did. And he never showed up. And I, I think uh, Len Springfield tried to and contact And he slammed him. the phone down. He yelled no and slammed the phone down. Yes. Yeah, so uh, so the, the, the point simply is in Martusi's case, uh, we didn't get any, any testimony, right. but he was clearly agitated by the question. He was. He was. But these people you mentioned, they were all on the same flight taking... And verified the flight and verified the conditions of the flight and the, and the crate hidden in bomb pit one, for example, which in itself was highly unusual. But getting back to Colonel Skelly, and as I was allowed into the home in Riverside, California, and his wife, he went, he was in his bathrobe, so he went to put on a pair of pants, that type of thing. His wife took me aside and, and, and said, you, you need to get him to talk. I've tried over and over again. Every time something is, you know, presented on the subject, he walks out of the room, says, don't ask me. And each and every time I asked him, specifically about, do you remember Robert Slusher? Do you remember, again, people within your own, as far as part of your own crew, which was not which was necessary evil. And as you remember, the plane that was substituted was uh, Dave's Dream. Yes. And so he kept coming back to, well, why do you need to know this? It wasn't like, I don't remember. It was like, but why do you need to know this? And no matter what answer I gave him, such as, well, don't you think your wife needs to know the truth? Shouldn't you tell your wife? Even after I leave, why don't you finally you know, confide to your own wife? And then he started to play the, uh, the, the lapse of memory. And he didn't remember anyone. He didn't remember Thaddeus D. Love, for example. I mean, you remember when he went to, uh, yes. to visit with his widow, and she would barely crack the door talking with him. But uh, such a name as Thaddeus Love, that type of thing. So where I left it was that I was going to have the others, the survivors of that crew, right. call her up and see if they could coordinate, orchestrate something to finally approach her, her husband and see what could develop out of it. So I did all that. I had, I had three people. Well, let, me, let me interrupt here because okay. I think we're going to have to take a break. Oh, okay. So we'll be right back with Don Schmidt. We'll continue on with some of the information about Roswell. Uh, so stick around. It's hard to listen to the news without realizing we're living in volatile, unprecedented times. Yet never has there been such an opportunity to transform the human condition. As old structures fail, where can we find the guidance to co-create a better way? Find Your Path Home is an ever-evolving, leading-edge information, education, and healing resource center designed to support and guide you on your path to unity and enlightenment. Based on sound principles employed by Shaman Worldwide, we provide techniques that can support you through the current transitions, offering online shamanic classes, 
international long-distance Shamana healing sessions, complimentary Mission Evolution radio episodes and Stairway to Heaven TV vignettes, seminars, retreats, and much more. All of this can be found on findyourpathhome.com. So I was watching the X-Zone TV channel last night when I was abducted by aliens and they kept repeating to me over and over again, simultv.com, simultv.com. What's simultv.com? That's what I asked them. They had it written on the side of their UFO. How do you spell that? UFO. No, I mean simultv.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Right. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Interesting that you were abducted by aliens in a simultv.com UFO last night. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Now that you mention it, I remember now last night I was awakened from a deep sleep. My great-grandmother was standing there. She said she'd come from the hereafter to tell me about simultv.com. She even spelled it out for me. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. Wow. Yeah. Guys, you'll never guess what my psychic guru just told me. SIMULTV.com. Exactly. Are you guys psychic too? Of course. We all know about SIMULTV.com. SIMULTV.com. I am here with Don Schmidt. We are in Roswell, New Mexico, believe it or not. And we're talking about the Roswell case because in Roswell, what else would we talk about? When we took our break, Don was expounding on uh, <laughs> Felix Martusi and the and the flight crew that uh, took some of the materials to Roswell and the trouble of getting the uh, people to talk and, and the value of some of the secondhand testimony that we've gotten. So, but specifically, uh, you mentioned Mart- Martucci, his commanding officer, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Edgar Skelly. And then yes. as I was uh, departing from his residence and the, the game plan with his wife, having the others try to all work together with her and then approach her husband and see if he then would uh, maybe recant as far as his lack of memory and uh, inability to say anything further on. So in doing that, I had three of his former crewmen ready to actually talk with her and then hopefully to him. So I would call her back to um, announce that everything was set and I kept my word. And she yells into the phone, I have nothing more to say to you. Don't ever call again. And if you ever do, I will report you to the police. And I just said, no, just wait a minute. Calm down a second. Can't, may I just ask you, did your husband say anything after I left? He told me never to speak to you again. Did your husband call anyone? Well, as a matter of fact, he did. And it was about you. And so, okay, one can again put, you know. Uh, well, yeah, I've, I've run into that a couple well, of, of times we, myself. We, we did, we did. Uh, uh, Johnny McBoyle, for example, you yeah. recall that situation. Well, I was going to think yeah. of General Cruikshank, who was at one time yes. in charge of uh, ATEC, the Air Technical Intelligence Center at Wright Patterson. And mm-hmm. I figured he might have heard something in the course of his assignments there. And he was a retired four star general. And he was in some of the documents at that time. As yes. Far as that, yeah. And uh, the thing he said to me was, I do not know who you are. I do not know what is classified still and what has mm-hmm. been declassified. And I do not need to talk to you and right. hung up. So we've run into that, but I think the point I was getting at here was the problem with the secondhand testimonies and how valuable they may be because of the problems Mm -hmm. you run into with the embellishments or misinterpretations or misunderstanding or having um, added to that those memories, those secondhand memories given by the, the, the right person by reading other documents about Roswell or seeing magazines about Roswell or seeing documentaries about Roswell. So that would all confabulate into a a much bigger picture. Absolutely. But as any prosecutor, any defense attorney would tell you that when the second hand corroborates the first, or there's a preponderance of second hand that then substantiates or verifies or corroborates the first, it doesn't make it first hand testimony. It just solidifies the first especially if it all well, is I, I, essentially the same information. I'm, I'm, still, I'm still bothered by secondhand testimony. I, I, I know, but unfortunately, that's often what we have to deal with. Well, that's all we have left now. That's all we have left now. Because I can't think of anybody who's still alive. And it's not as though we're seeking out Joe Blow, who happened to go to school with the, the individual 40 years ago. 
we are still focusing on the families. We are still talking to the spouses, and mainly the wives, if they're still alive. And a thought that I think we'd be, we'd be hard pressed to think of many wives that stretched the truth. If anything, they were more protective. We we had a hard time getting to the husbands because the wives wouldn't allow us to even speak to them. I'm, I'm not I'm not saying that they've done anything consciously. Right, right. When we talk about confabulation, sure. we're talking about not necessarily, you know, it's it's not the truth, but they haven't they haven't uh, made it up themselves. They've drawn on other sources. And there's I, so much information available. That, yes, and so that's much, my point. So much on television. Every, everyone's been coached. Everyone. That was one of the things with Bud Hopkins years ago, as far as with his, and I, I won't even call them abduction. I call them missing time because there could be so many other solutions as to why there's a memory lapse. But the thought that when you're essentially placing all your control information on the table, you have contaminated the entire field. We could take this entire museum and have everyone, you know, hypnotically regressed, and they would all describe some semblance of an abduction experience based on what they've read, heard, seen. Well, I think one of the one of the key examples of some of that is um, a guy named Trowbridge. Yes, yes, who, who, precisely. Who told people that he had been at the Marcel house on right. the night of the the very night the very uh, night uh, that Marcel returned from the deep debris field, I don't know why I can't speak, the debris field, and uh, there was supposedly a bridge game going on at the Marcel At the house. very time that Marcel returned back from the And, and you're, trying, side, yeah. you're trying to figure out why would Vo Marcel, his wife, be hosting a bridge party with him gone, absent, right. and she never said and, anything and to actually, us about it. actually, not only just absent, but on assignment, because you don't know when he's coming back. And and uh, but she never said anything to us about that. She and Jesse Marcel Jr. never said anything. And they were both in the house. Exactly. Yeah, right. And so there's no one, not even secondhand, to substantiate that even you know scenario. But if you go if you go to his ob obituary, mm -hmm. which really set me off, right. it's mentioned in his obituary. He was the last surviving member to have seen the actual debris. And who and, and who wrote that obituary? His son, who was the biggest promoter of his involvement, in fact, when he brought him here to the museum, the son was doing most of the talking. Well, I, th I think you've just proven my point. Yeah. And, and and so in his case, he was trying to exploit the fact that his father was here in 1947, and what better way to capitalize as far as on, uh, on the entire event. His son, for example, would contact the museum and wanted us to display some of his father's plaques and some of his military memorabilia. That's right. And we just, but he wanted to charge us, oh. have us pay for it. Well, I was going to say, I, I can't see a problem with having that sort of memorabilia in the museum because it would do. be nice. As we've had. It would be nice but to see not, that sort of but, thing. Okay, but it's going to cost you this much. Yeah, then, no, then, no. then we move on. Let to me ask else. you, as far as, especially as, a, as an officer, uh, the fact that it's a 4th of July weekend and after Brazo brings the mature and then the, the whole scenario as far as the Frank Joyce, the KGFL, and then them being referred to the base, they get Marcel. He happens to be the one who actually takes the call. He's eating a sandwich, and uh, he's at the PX, and the rest is history. But it's important enough that they alert Blanchett, the base commander. Well, I think something, I think what happens there is Brazel shows up at the sheriff's office here in Roswell. He doesn't know what he has. And the it's, sheriff doesn't know. And the sheriff does. doesn't recognize it. Right. And they, but but Brazel says it looked like it was something from the air, given the debris field, the way right. the debris field the looks. Of it, right. And he thought it would be belong to somebody out to the base. So the sheriff calls out to the base, mm -hmm. and who who would he ask for? Um, I would think he would ask for maybe the well, ask for the operations officer, the, the operations officer, officer, the officer as far as or the officer the, of the day, duty, or the officer of the day. But it's nonetheless still and, it's still Marcel who gets yeah. the call. And then, still, important enough that holiday weekend, they alert the very base commander. Well, there is such a thing in the military calls uh, the essential elements of intelligence. Mm -hmm. And these are things that you have to report to the commander. And I know right. when we were serving in Iraq, we had an incident where one of our soldiers was lightly wounded. I mean, just basically a scratch. Not yes. bad at all, but it was in the middle of the night mm -hmm. when it happened. And I came into the tactical operations center 5 o'clock in the morning. And I asked the NCO on duty, anything happened last night? And he said, well, we had a soldier injured. And I said, did you call the commander? And he said, well, no, Captain Newbuyer said it wasn't bad enough to wait till morning. And I said, no, call him now. Right. And uh, he called him and I overheard the conversation. He kept saying, yes, sir, yes, sir. Captain Randall just told me that, sir, mm -hmm. <laughs> because mm -hmm. it's something that you would do. So something like that, 
there's a possibility of an aircraft accident, not necessarily from the 509th, because they would know if there was right. one of their aircraft right. missing, but you would alert the commanding officer about it. And that. yet, as we know, there was nothing reported missing. They were not placed on any alert as far as uh, that anything being tested or any air, air aircraft missing or disabled as far as during that, that time period. And then the fact that Blanchard would not just dispel Dispatch well, got a couple of enlisted men. He sends his two head of intelligence. Well, he sends, he sends Marcel and he sends Cabot. Right, right. Who was the counterintelligence guy. In the just event it's something foreign. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because they don't know what it is. And that's the whole point, that yeah. we're going up this whole... Which doesn't which doesn't mean it's extraterrestrial. Exactly. It just means we found it's something me, we don't know what it is. we can't recognize, and it still comes back to yes. any remnants of any type of balloon, mogul, or any other balloon. Somebody certainly would have recognized. Well, Marcel would have. Uh, Marcel uh, Brazel would have recognized it because he'd found weather balloons on other occasions. And you, you and I both recall that we arrived at the very ranch house that time, and they had that open water tank. Yes. And all the slabs of rubber and debris that were floating at the top, and we made we asked, well, what is this? And they, they well, it's all the balloons we've recovered on the ranch through the years. I know uh, um, Brazel was quoted in the newspaper and said, well, I found weather observation devices like this two times before, and it looked right. nothing like those. So right. we've eliminated the balloons, basically. Right. But but they've got something they do not recognize, so it makes perfect sense for the sheriff to call out to the base to find out. Of course. And it makes perfect sense for the people at the base to send somebody out to inspect it. To but see again, if it because no one is able to identify yes. these remnants. They That's don't know the what point. it is. That's the point. Which again, doesn't take us to the extraterrestrial. No, no, I, I could not agree more. And that's the whole point. But then we're relying strictly short of, you know, the physical evidence or the remains themselves that we have to uh, at least try to reason how they reason at the time. Okay, well, we're going to continue with the discussion on why would they go to the ranch and the stuff about Roswell and secondhand witnesses and all that. I'm here with Don Schmidt in Roswell, New Mexico, believe it or not. I'll have information about this uh, up on my blog at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. And Don is the author of a number of books about Roswell, including the Witness to Roswell and some of the other books like that. So you can take a look at um, his website at www.roswellinvestigator.com. There you go. Uh, from the man's mouth himself, we will be back right after this with more from Roswell, New Mexico. So stick around. How would your life change if you could develop the business and personal skills that you need in order to make more money? Do you want to learn how to achieve your big life goals faster? Then go to findhiddenmoney.com and get the Goal For It online course. The course teaches you how you can set and achieve your biggest goals while completely overcoming the roadblocks to your goals so that you can realize your dreams and imagine more success. Go to findhiddenmoney.com. Memorable dynamic presentations are a not-so-secret weapon in the business world. Do you have a powerful message that must be shared, but you haven't found a way to deliver that message? Do you want to be known as a top public speaker who gets amazing results? Are you ready to create and deliver your powerful message? Thomas Hides can help you create and deliver your speech to get the results you desire. Visit IconQuality.com. Did you expect your business to flourish, but instead it plateaued or didn't get off the ground yet? Would you like to achieve massive goals and discover new sources of income within your business? When you're ready to experience that type of success with fast results, Cindy Hendricks is the business coach for you. Her work with entrepreneurs and business owners has been life-changing. To get you and your business where you want to be, go to imaginemoresuccess.com. Has the fear of public speaking stalled your business or personal life? What would you give to develop and maintain supreme confidence? Have an invaluable private program to always perform at your best. 
Imagine how you would feel. You can have all that and so much more today with Thomas Hyde's life-changing course called Number One Fear Unleashed. Visit NumberOneFear.com and be liberated from your fear of public speaking. I am in Roswell, New Mexico with Don Schmidt. We're just kind of discussing, I guess, the problems with the investigations and witnesses, especially when we're dealing with something that's uh, more than 70 years old. We're, we're stuck with, uh, stuck with, we have very few people who are alive who were there in 1947, which is kind of a sad thing. And I know, oh, gee whiz, it must have been eight or nine years ago, we were, we were looking for some of the other people. And I talked to a guy who was 89 years old. He'd been here at Roswell at the time. Um, and his, his comment to me, by the way, and I, and I know I alerted you to this, Don, he said, well, you know, we were just told not to talk about it. And I don't remember a whole lot of what was going on because, you know, the guy's 89 years old. Uh, but just kind of. But that was a very honest response. Yeah, we were and, just told not to talk about it. And and here's and here's the thing. I mean, here's a guy I called cold, and he has some memories. We didn't get into any detail because he didn't remember any detail. And I think he was kind of on the periphery of the whole thing. But it, I, I guess, it, you begin to looking at the preponderance of the evidence. You know, here's one more person who was involved in some fashion talking to us, as opposed to the secondhand witnesses. You mentioned like Trowbridge, and in, yes, as far as in whether it was. Mostly a combination of his son or just leaving his father at that later age in his life and trying to, you know, create some form of legacy and connection with the event. But when it becomes a drawn out, you know, full description of detail, then obviously we suspect that it's more than likely embellished and fabricated. But when you get these little snippets, I saw this. I remember this. In this case, this gentleman, we were told not to say anything. Yeah. Those are the most believable. Well, but it, it, it really doesn't, again, it doesn't lead us to the again, extraterrestrial. Of course and, not. And, uh, you know, when we start talking about people sworn to secrecy, I remember giving classified briefings. Right. And the first thing you say at the classified briefing, you are not authorized to talk to anybody about this who is not cleared to hear it. Precisely. Um, so I think that in some cases, those sorts of benign reminders... Mm -hmm have been confabulated into something much more ominous than um, they really were. It was just, this is a classified mission. This is a classified right. operation. This is a right. classified event. Don't talk about it. Which is, for example, the flight, the crew, the 393rd that were on days, or on um, straight flush. Yes. On the return flight with Marcel. And essentially, they were told, don't talk. It was a non-flight, non-scheduled flight. And then, you know, it's up to us to see or determine what possibly was their cargo, and in some way, is it related? Yeah. And because it happens during that time period, unless someone can demonstrate that it was something unrelated, then it's incumbent on them. I mean, were they hauling a mogul balloon? Were they hauling as far as the, the general's furniture? Remember, that's yeah. what they were told, that type of thing. And so a lot of it becomes part of that the entire investigative process, like that old uh, Japanese murder uh, movie in 1950, The Rashomon Effect. And basically where both the prosecution and the defense demonstrate essentially the same argument, that you have your position as far as the defense, and then the prosecution has their position, and then there's what really happened. Yes. And it's a matter of then either side being able to determine without having a preconceived position as to this is what happened, this is only what happened, as opposed to those who are still trying to determine. Well, what I happened. think when we look at the Roswell case, because we have so many participants mm -hmm. and there are so many people that want to be participants who may not have been. And I, the thing that, that, that opened my eyes was a book called Stolen Valor. And it's about all these people who claim to be Vietnam veterans. When I came back from Vietnam, people didn't want to talk about it. You didn't mention it. Um, it was just something that it, it wasn't discussed. And I remember uh, when I worked at Rockwell International, they found out after several years I, would, I was a Vietnam veteran. And one of the women says, but you seem so normal. <laughs> yes. The point yeah. being, you know, we right. just didn't talk about it. And now we have all these people who claim to be Vietnam veterans who right. – right. 
didn't serve in Vietnam. One of them, uh, uh, is he a senator or a congressman? I think we know who we're talking about. But uh, The one that presented me the Bronze Star? Yes, as I <laughs> recall, yes, yes. But mentioning that, I, I mentioned his story like John Custer Mullen, who did, who's done most of the work on the 509 and the atomic bomb. And, and, and he would tell me, he would say, Don, you'd be surprised how many servicemen, how many pilots, and crewmen through the years have told me they were either on an Olegay or a boxcar. And, and then certainly they weren't. No. But it doesn't disqualify the fact that they both, those, both those flights, you know, existed. And, and for those who may not be up on their history, the uh, Anola Gay dropped the atomic bomb on Japan at Nagasaki. Hiroshima. Yeah. Oh, Hiroshima. Hiroshima, right. And the uh, boxcar at, uh, and at one was Nagasaki. Uh, uh, Paul Tibbetts, and the other yeah. one was Chuck Sweeney, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but, I mean, the point simply is, in, in the Stolen Valor, it was literally hundreds and hundreds of people coming forward with their tales of, of murder and mayhem in, in Vietnam, and, and we learned that this guy was in the Army, but he wasn't deployed to Vietnam. And many of them incriminating fellow servicemen oh, absolutely. in events that never took place. Because that was, that was the narrative that the, the, the... And it got them all the attention. Well, and it was the narrative that the the military, not the military, the media wanted to follow. That, exactly. That we they were, were all a bunch. Of, well, we were a bunch of hired killers when you think about yeah. it. <laughs> but, but but I mean the point the point simply is you've got all these people coming forward now with their incredible tales of what they did in Vietnam, and you learn that they they didn't do any of those things. And and some of us who were actually in Vietnam, we can sometimes recognize the stories for being bogus because they don't have of the course. terminology right. I'm, I'm sure you and I agree on uh, Philip Corso, for example. Oh, yeah. And then the, here, after the fact, and I had interviewed Corso on two occasions, and I found him, you know, a congenial... Con sure, a charming, charming fellow. Charming fellow. But, but a liar. To, to, to learn after the fact that he had made two previous trips to Roswell. And where did he stay on both of those occasions? With Frank Kaufman. Oh, yeah, they were good buddies. And they were I, good buddies. And the point being, then, in the book, the first chapter, as far as providing the summary of Roswell, it's 100% Frank Kaufman. Well, the interesting thing is, and for those of you who don't know, Frank Kaufman was a witness that Don and I had believed in the beginning because we were pointed well, to him. Well, he by, was potentially a star witness, and, firsthand. And, and we were pointed to him by, by Walter Hott, but um, we, we learned that Kaufman was making the whole thing up. He was not involved he in any way. He was forging way. documents. He was, forging, uh, yes, documents. yes. But the point here is that Corso and he appeared on Coast to Coast. Yes. And what was interesting is every time uh, Kaufman said something or a question was asked, Corso would defer to yes. Kaufman. Yes. And that tells me that Corso isn't who he was Precisely. because he thought Kaufman, Kaufman had was been who he said he was. Yeah. But Corso... Um, story of, of seeing the bodies, and I, I explain this for the people who may not be familiar with the name, uh, um, at, at Fort Riley, and having done convoys in the military, I know how those things worked, and the story of how he saw the bodies was just completely and totally preposterous. Yeah, preposterous you, yeah. It's not the way you run convoys. They, they stopped it overnight at uh, Fort Riley, okay, fine. They unloaded the cargo, the classified cargo, mm -hmm. put it in a veterinary clinic, and one of the sergeants from the base who was guarding it uh, was peeking in the boxes and found the body and then called Corso over mm -hmm. to see one of the alien bodies. This is absolutely preposterous. It was, like it was nonchalant. It was like, oh, come and see this curiosity. Yeah. But the thing is, on a convoy like that, what you're going to do is you're going to have – you're not going to unload the, the – the, To begin with, right. The uh, uh, trucks. The second of all, you're going to have your own guards. Right. You're right. not – if there's, if there's yeah. guards from the local uh, uh, fort, the local – uh, division guarding your convoy, they're going to be on the perimeter. You're going to have your guys sitting on the trucks. And you don't change as far as the vehicles. You change the the drivers. Yes. The, 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 but the point, but point is, you're not going to unload it and all this. So the Corso story of seeing the bodies was completely and totally bogus. But the thing that really bugged me was on the cover of his book, it said he was a colonel. Right. It turned out he was a lieutenant, lieutenant colonel. colonel. Right. And the answer. So the problem was not, well, I was promoted to colonel after I retired, which we could never establish. Mm -hmm. But the answer to the question was the publisher misunderstood because I was referred to as colonel. Didn't understand that, you know, lieutenant colonel. There is a distinction, right. Are also, and, and that, would have, that would have been the perfect answer mm -hmm. and everybody is happy, mm -hmm. but he, he lied about that as mm -hmm. well. So we run into that all the time. And, and 
Corso's book is still held up as one of the... It is, and it's still a bestseller. I mean, you go on to Amazon, my God, it is still selling like it's fresh copy. And uh, it's yes, amazing. Yes, I'm jealous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you would agree with me on this premise. The idea that here we are, are now 30 years later. And sure, there are always going to... I mean, and any detective agency, any police officer, depending as far as on the nature and the publicity of a case, would say that... In any one given situation, you will get dozens of false leads. You will get a lot of confessions even to the same event, and it all has to be tossed. It doesn't negate the fact that something happened. In the case of Roswell, something did crash. Oh, absolutely. So was the Everybody and, agrees. And the point being that after 30 years, we shouldn't expect any less, that there is going to be a lot of confabulation. There, is, there are going to be a lot of fake, phony witnesses. But the point being that if all we're left with is that it was? It still involves something that, to this day, we still don't know what it was. Doesn't mean that we just walk away from it and say, "Well, because we have a few Glenn Dennis's that we give up on it," or do we still, at the very chance that it may be what the witnesses say it was, that we still may be on the brink of the biggest story of the, of the millennium in that regard? Because no one has been able to provide an alternative at this point. Well, With any eyewitness testimony to support that position. We're, we're going to have to take another break here. Okay. So uh, when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about um, some of the alternative explanations that have been offered for the Roswell case and how they don't really uh, fit facts as we Precisely. know them and, and they, what the witnesses have told us. Uh, once again, take a look at my blog at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. And for those of, those, those of you who would like to see an instance where the government was kind of covering up the... Uh, symbol seen at the Socorro case, I take, take a look at Encounters in the Desert, which is the book I did about the Socorro landing. And uh, we will be back with Don Schmidt right after this, so hang around. Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. They are here, and they've been here for thousands of years, making their presence known in the shadows. They might be seen by a lonely motorist on a deserted road late at night, or by a frightened and confused husband in the bedroom he is sharing with his wife. But who are they? What do they want? Why are they here? Perhaps most concerning, has the government been aware of their presence all along? The new book by Ellie Marzulli, UFO Disclosure, The 70-Year Cover-Up Exposed, delves into the world of UFOs. Can full disclosure be soon? Order now and receive a free hour and 37-minute DVD on the UFO phenomenon, UFOs Are Real. Get both the book and the DVD, a $40 value, for only $19.99. To order your book and DVD today, go to lamarzuli.net. That's L-A-M-A-R-Z-U-L-L-I.net. Christopher Fulton is a survivor of the National Security State. All he wanted to do was preserve history when he acquired a Cartier watch from the estate of President Kennedy's personal secretary. But that simple act set off a terrible chain reaction. He was pursued by the U.S. Justice Department and the FBI, thrust into the middle of the U.S. government's Assassination Records Review Board, even monitored and pursued by the Russian government. All because that Cartier watch was the missing link of evidence, a timepiece worn by JFK that fateful day in Dallas, a link resulting in Christopher being incarcerated and attacked for nine years 
Lawrence because he opened a hidden chapter in history. The intriguing journey outlined fully in Christopher Fulton's memoir, The Inheritance, is available now through Trinday.com or Amazon.com. The Inheritance, Poisoned Fruit of JFK's Assassination by Christopher and Michelle Fulton is a must-read, an incredible tale of how easily our own government can overrule justice. The Inheritance, Poisoned Fruit of JFK's Assassination. Roswell, New Mexico. I'm sitting here with Don Schmidt. We've been talking about the Roswell case. And um, when we broke, we were kind of getting off into some of the alternative explanations. And I think one of the points that we'll end up making here is that we've looked at a number of alternatives. What could it be other than something extraterrestrial? And why not being able to identify it doesn't lead us directly to the extraterrestrial. It certainly eliminates all the terrestrial explanations. And one of the big ones was Project Mogul, this um, idea of a balloon that they were going to put into the acoustical level in the atmosphere so they could spy on the Russians uh, detonating atomic explosions. And it was supposedly highly classified. Nobody knew about it. Launch number four and doesn't work. But the real point is the purpose of Mogul was top secret. The experiments being conducted in New Mexico were not. They were not classified. In fact, the term mogul was out in the public arena. And pictures of mogul to, mogul uh, arrays were published in the newspapers on July 10th, 1947. So mogul as an explanation really doesn't work. Not for a second. In fact, the the jet stream as far as as far as that, that, that CB Moore, as far as the efforts that almost like twisting themselves into a pretzel and trying to essentially place even Launch 4 near the Foster Ranch at that time. Well, that really doesn't matter, and here's why. Well, it doesn't matter. But but, but, but here's why. Yeah. Here's why. Albert Crary's diary. Yes. Albert Crary is the man running the experiments here in New Mexico at, at, at Alamogordo. Right. He's the guy in charge. He writes in his field notes. Exactly. The flight was canceled. It was canceled. They jettisoned the balloons because they were already helium filled, but the arrays were not. But part here, of, but yeah. here's the problem: for Moore's explanation to work, they've got to launch him at two thirty in the morning. Yes. The CAA, which was the forerunner to the FAA, mm-hmm. would not allow them to fly the Precisely. arrays. In the there dark, were, there were restrictions as far as after dark for obvious reasons. Because the array was huge and it would be a hazard to an aerial so navigation. aircraft, precisely. They couldn't launch them in the clouds. And Crary's diary says, yeah. no flight today right. because of clouds. Right. Well, that would have been at dawn, not at 2.30 in the morning. So when Moore starts calculating the flight launch from 2.30, he's making it up. Exactly. exactly. So. And so you have nothing that the skeptics will say, well, they flew a cluster of balloons, and but we know point, what the definition of the cluster was. But the point is it still comes down to it's still off-the-shelf material. It's the same Rowan it's, balloon array with the acoustic listing device. That's all it yeah. And the fact that the project is, is classified top secret, but the materials were off-the-shelf material. A five-year-old child would have recognized it. And the, what they were doing in New Mexico was not classified. Was not classified. There so. was a, a story about it being an A-2, which I think was a multi-stage V-2 rocket. Uh, A-10, actually. A-10. 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 And we yeah, had talked right. to you as far as that scientist at, uh, at, uh, White Sands. at Alamogordo that time in White Sands. And he said that it could have, but the point is the Germans never had any work in prototypes as far as the two-stage A-10 rockets. But I was able to get a, a complete listing of all the launches, mm-hmm. and there's nothing there. There's nothing there, correct. And, and they, they called them round numbers, and you would see that um, they weren't necessarily sequential, so that flight the launch number 10 might show up sometime after launch 18, so they would propose, p- postpone a flight, but each one was numbered. And sometimes the launches were out of sync. Out of sync, but you still have. But the they date. were all there. They were dated. Yeah. They were all there. And then, like we we, we throw in the equation as far as uh, like Annie Jacobson's Area 51 source, as far as uh, or just that single appendix, as far as and the very idea of uh, Dr. Joseph Mengele. Well, sorry, ladies and gentlemen, he did escape to South America. That's where he was not captured by the Soviet Union. He lived out the rest of his life in South America. The only prototype of the Horton flying ring. You know, was is in the presently in the Smithsonian, and it's just tubular bicycle metal and varnished wood. That's all it is. Well, we looked. I looked at the uh, whole Horton 
um, evolution mm -hmm. of their tailless aircraft. Right. And so we could see that. We also looked at the flying wings from Northrop. Northrop. A flying and at wing. the time, as you recall, they were being converted to jet propulsion, so they were not operational at that time in July well, in, 47. In, in late June for uh, Kenneth Arnold sighting right. near Mount Rainier, and later on, they were not they were not flying. That's correct. And That's they correct. didn't fly the jet version until October. So we're making uh, an, an argument here, at least for the the fluidity as far as of an investigation, that it's not a, a case of where this is, you know, the final solution. This is the final as far as explanation, as much as we still don't know. We And we looked at multiple different explanations. Uh, we wondered Fugal if... Fugal balloon bombs, as far as Japanese Fugal balloon bombs. Oh, yes. As far, and certainly V-2 rockets. And even, we even looked at a Japanese atomic bomb. Well, the, 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 the Fugal balloons, we have, to, we have to point out that these were... Um, um, weapons of war designed by the Japanese, and they had discovered the jet stream. And what they would Correct. do is put these balloons into the jet stream and hope they would get across the. Uh, was it one made Pacific. as far east as Ohio or Michigan? Michigan, yeah. And there was there were three found in Iowa. And there was were, the there were the, the the lone fatalities were was that mother and some and their sure. children in Seattle. Or, or, well, no, it's um, in. What Oregon, was Washington? Oregon, it was Oregon, Oregon, yeah. Oregon. And uh, they the just only the only stumbled upon it, yeah. And they were drinking on the and rise it, it and it detonated. It detonated. Right, but the right. thing, the thing is, they are the only uh, uh, enemy action deaths in the continental United States during the Second World precisely, War. Precisely, precisely. But uh, we looked at all of that stuff, and we knew where the balloons landed. And there was nothing that would suggest the balloon would stay up two years and then fall. Which was the joke then, uh, that we posed to John Keel, who was the advocate of that theory. Well, then I guess the balloons were, were circling the planet for two years, right? But, and but he uh, he quickly backed off yes, from that. Yes. Uh, so, I mean, the point simply is we've looked at an awful lot of different explanations for what it could have been. Could have been. Uh, could they have dropped an atomic bomb by mistake in the area? And if well, that would have been know, classified. But we, we know, for example, like the incident that was in 57 outside of Albuquerque when it fell out of Bombay. And they kept kept that secret for you know the next 30 years but the point is we know about it we know about that precisely and in 1947 the shape and size of the atomic bomb was classified so had they dropped even a practice bomb by mistake there would have been an effort to pick it up and what were they actually using as far as their test drops as far as here around the base back in 47 they were using sand barrels of equivalent weight so so I guess the point simply is we found no terrestrial explanation. The Air Force itself said there, there were no plane crashes, either experimental or uh, operational, Correct. that would count for Correct. it. So the Air Force helped us out on that respect. Exactly. Um, and in General Ramey's cancellation of the resumption of the flight on the right field at that time, and yet we do know for a fact that the flight did resume and take debris onto right field. So what was what was tested there? Well, the, the interesting thing that that comes out of the FBI uh, uh, statement that we that, that everybody knows about the but, FBI telex that from Dallas, yes. the Dallas bureau office. But but here's the problem: I don't think the FBI ever went out to right field. Or, I mean, so, I'm sorry, Carswell or, or Fort Worth Army Airfield at the time. I at think it was all telephonic. Right, yeah. It was all telephonic. And it says it was telephonic. Absolutely. Telephonic conversation between our office and their base. So it was not borne out by it this police. It was major, right. major Curtin, and they misspelled his name. That's right. So, I mean, I, I mentioned this level of detail simply to, to point out that we've done an awful lot of research trying to get at the very bottom of this sort of thing. And we know an awful lot of stuff that happened. We know, uh, we, we know a lot of what couldn't have happened. And where none of the uh, the testimonies even suggest those alternative explanations. It's not like we ever, for example, had anyone suggest that this was a German flying wing, or that this was a V two rocket. But we have had air, some, but we have had somebody say that it was a Russian copy of a B twenty nine. That's correct. And we yeah. were able to pretty well squash that as well. Yes, yes. And it's not that we're trying to to to, to squash these things. It's it, it's somebody made that that uh, claim, and I spent a lot of time researching the Soviet Union's reconstruction of the B-29s and right. what they were doing with right. them at the time, and there was absolutely no evidence that any of them ever got I mean, you to and I spent a lot of time, in fact, entire chapters in the earlier books as far as the alternative explanations, and, and we found every one of them wanting. Yeah. So, um, 
And but again, that doesn't get us to the extraterrestrial. No. There, there could be something classified no. that we have not discovered. But it's like then it would have to be bigger than the bomb. It would have to be something and, so sensitive after all these years. And the Air Force would have trotted it out in the mid nineteen when they had the opportunity to provide. They say, Here's an explanation, guys. Here it is. Exactly. Here it is. exactly. And so, they didn't do that. Instead, they came up with their ludicrous anthropomorphic dummies. Which, to this day, I mean, and the whole idea of time travel. Yeah. yeah nonsense. Well, Don, we've had a... Spirited. Well, yeah, I was going to say lively. <laughs> lively discussion of Roswell. I know, but we haven't solved anything, but we have... I think we've, we've pointed out some of the thinking on this, and I think that people understand that we haven't... Um, uh, left completely to the extraterrestrial, Precisely. and I, I think in this environment today, you know, I've kind of backed off a somewhat from that, mm -hmm. saying mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. Uh, there is no terrestrial explanation that doesn't get us to the extraterrestrial. We need something else. I we know. need something more. And as you know, that's why we still continue the archaeological work at the site, and that's why there are still certain families that we suspect maybe hoarding, holding on to something, and uh, someday. And hopefully in our lifetimes, whether it's a case of disclosure or just that we finally come up with a government, solution. A government document would be nice yes, that it isn't, would be. isn't fraudulent, MJ-12. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and we get and we see fraudulent documents all the time as well now. And so, you know, we've got to look at all of that sort of thing. But we are sitting here in Roswell. We're surrounded by people in the museum who are interested in this case. And I am just flabbergasted about the number of people coming through. So it's something that's clearly... Uh, touched a nerve with a lot of people, and they're interested in what's going on. And lest anyone would think, Kevin and I don't get a penny from the museum for any ongoing research or any contributions towards our future work. I will be here in Roswell for a few more days. My plan is to interview some more people about a variety of talkies, not just uh, not just. Um, Roswell, as some abductees are here, or abduction researchers and things like that, we'll be talking about this. Take a look at my blog when you get a chance at www.kevinrandall.blogspot and Don's website is www.roswellinvestigator.com I will be back in uh, with a 167 hours with another episode of A Different Perspective, so keep your uh, calendars open. We'll talk to you then. If you are looking for a safe, zero-calorie, natural option to the harmful artificial sweeteners on the market today, Just Like Sugar is what you're looking for. Just Like Sugar is a wonderful natural alternative for those health-conscious people who choose a calorie-restricted diet with a great, pure, sweet flavor that tastes just like sugar. Just Like Sugar is a great natural option for people suffering from diabetes and may be useful in restricted diet programs where standard sugars are not allowed and does not cause a laxative effect of some other sweeteners. Just Like Sugar comprises a perfect blend of chicory root fiber, natural calcium, natural vitamin C, and Just Like Sugar sweetness comes from the natural flavors from the peel of the orange. Just Like Sugar is a natural alternative to harmful artificial sweeteners and will change the way that you believe all natural sweetener products taste. Just Like Sugar is available at your local Whole Foods markets, Wild Oats markets, Henry's, Sun Harvest, and many other fine natural food stores in the U.S., Canada, and worldwide. They are here, and they've been here for thousands of years, making their presence known in the shadows. They might be seen by a lonely motorist on a deserted road late at night, or by a frightened and confused husband in the bedroom he is sharing with his wife. But who are they? What do they want? Why are they here? Perhaps most concerning, has the government been aware of their presence all along? The new book by Ellie Marzulli, UFO Disclosure, The 70-Year Cover-Up Exposed, delves into the world of UFOs. Can full disclosure be soon? Order now and receive a free hour and 37-minute DVD on the UFO phenomenon, UFOs Are Real. Get both the book and the DVD, a $40 value, for only $19.99. To order your book and DVD today, go to lamarzuli.net. That's L-A-M-A-R-Z-U-L-L-I dot net. You have heard of the X-Zone? Now watch it on Simul TV, plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide, and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well, it is, but you can have it today, right now. It is Simul TV. 
Simul TV offers what the others only wish they could provide. 15 exclusive channels like Exxon, Sci Fi, and Horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. Live streaming events from around the world. Interactive online network and much more. Tomorrow's TV today. Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at simultv.com. Do it today.